I think we'll get rolling here. So welcome everyone. My name is Kelly Harding and I'm the host of today's webinar. I'm the Director of Research Administration and a Research Associate with CANFASD. My background is in human development and interdisciplinary health, particularly in rural and northern communities. Um, and I've worked in the field of FASD since 2010 and work in a variety of research projects across a number of diverse areas relative to FASD. Um, but I'm also really happy to be joining you as the host today as the organizer of the CANFAS Trainee Program. So I would like to begin our meeting today with a land acknowledgement. An important step in reconciliation is the acknowledgement of traditional treaty lands and recognition for the people of the territory. The Canada FASD Research Network recognizes the historical significance and contributions of Indigenous peoples and their cultures, and understands the important role that the Indigenous community plays today and in the future. We acknowledge that we live, work, and meet on traditional territories across Canada of many of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I wish to personally acknowledge that the land on which I gather, work, and play, and I'm calling in from today, is in Robinson-Huron Huron, Hur Robinson Treaty Territory, my apologies, and the traditional lands of the Atika Mekshang Anishinaabek and the Wanapate First Nation. So just a few housekeeping items before we get going today. First, we'll be recording this presentation and it will be available uh, at a later date on the CANFAS YouTube channel. And second, this Zoom today has the Q&A function enabled where participants can ask questions and upvote these questions so that the most common ones rise to the top. We will have time today after the completion of all of the presentations to have speakers answer questions uh, that are put forth. So at any time throughout any of the presentations, if you have a question for the speakers, please do put it in the Q&A uh, place in Zoom. So today's webinar is a special one as it showcases the work of this year's CANFASD trainees. The trainee program is designed for students, early career researchers, and professionals in Canada working in the field of FASD. Beginning in January of this year, 10 trainees were invited to take part in the program. Nominated by our CANFASD research leads and associates and community partners connected to CANFASD, the trainees represent a pan-Canadian group of students, researchers, and service providers from a wide range of disciplines and levels of training. The goals of this program are to build research capacity in the field of FASD, foster mentorship, networking, and collaboration among trainees and leading Canadian researchers, and to encourage the next generation of up-and-coming FASD researchers. As part of this program, our trainees have the opportunity to profile their work to the CANFASD network through blog posts, newsletter updates, and public presentations like today's webinar. Given that the trainees are a diverse group, you will hear about a variety of projects using different approaches or methodologies and in various stages of completion. So for those of you joining today, welcome. And for those of you who were here last week, welcome back. Um, today, you will get to hear four presentations um, from our other five trainees in the program on a wide range of topics. So with that, our first presenter today is Taylor Watkins. Taylor is a CIHR funded graduate student in interdisciplinary health at Laurentian University, researching stigmatization of existing FASD prevention campaigns. Taylor's presentation will explore pregnant and postpartum individuals' attitudes about alcohol use during pregnancy and their perspectives on existing FASD prevention efforts, and will include, it will include recommendations for devising effective and non-stigmatizing community-based FASD prevention initiatives. So with that, Taylor, I will pass it over to you. Sounds great, thank you, Kelly. All right, so thank you, Kelly, again, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and hello everyone and good afternoon. Um, my name is Taylor and today I will be speaking to you about my research titled Supporting Healthy Pregnancies, Informing Effective and Non-Stigmatizing FASD Prevention Approaches in Northeastern Ontario. Before proceeding, I would like to disclose that some content in today's presentation may evoke negative feelings for some audience members and to please step away from the presentation when needed. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Laurentian University is in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, and the land on which I gather is the traditional territory of the Atikamishing and Anishinaabek and neighboring reserve Wanapate First Nation. As a settler, I understand I have privilege on these lands. 
I'm working through how I can best be a contributing treaty relative. I know I have and will continue to make mistakes, but promise to keep learning. Alcohol use during pregnancy is a leading preventable cause of developmental disability in Canada. Despite research suggesting that women are aware of the consequential repercussions of alcohol use during pregnancy, approximately 10 to 15% of Canadians report consuming alcohol during pregnancy. Several reasons may contribute to alcohol use during pregnancy, such as being unaware of the pregnancy and individual life circumstances such as alcohol dependency and intimate partner violence. A safe threshold for alcohol use during pregnancy has not been conclusively established. However, it is strongly advised to abstain from all alcohol use when pregnant and when planning to become pregnant. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or FASD is a lifelong disability that affects the development of a fetus as a result of prenatal alcohol exposure. FASD impacts approximately 4% of the Canadian population However, prevalence rates are suggested of being higher in rural, remote, and northern Canadian communities. Currently, there is a lack of research on the prevalence of FASD in these specific geographical regions, which limits our understanding of the exact proportion of the population with FASD. Therefore, further exploration is imperative to help inform effective prevention initiatives and reduce the prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy and FASD as a probable consequence. Previous literature has challenged the effectiveness of existing FASD prevention efforts, as FASD prevention initiatives have been heavily criticized for their harmful and stigmatizing nature, as emotional aspects of fear, guilt, and shock have been profoundly relied on to discourage individuals from consuming alcohol during pregnancy. Consequently, individuals may be reluctant to disclose information about their alcohol use and to report their alcohol use during pregnancy and refrain from seeking medical assistance. Alcohol use during pregnancy and FASD are reported being growing public health concerns in many Northern Canadian communities, therefore indicating that individuals of childbearing age in the Sudbury and Manitoulin regions of Northeastern Ontario may be more susceptible to alcohol-exposed pregnancies. According to the Public Health Sudbury and Districts, Reported rates of alcohol use during pregnancy are significantly lower in the Sudbury and Manitoulin districts in comparison to the Canadian national average. The discrepancy can be due to the stigmatizing nature surrounding FASD, thereby causing individuals within the Sudbury and Manitoulin regions to refrain from disclosing information regarding their alcohol use. Therefore, it is crucial to understand pregnant women and new mothers' attitudes towards alcohol use during pregnancy to help reduce the prevalence rates of alcohol-exposed pregnancies and inform non-stigmatizing community-based FASD prevention initiatives. Three research uh, objectives rather guided the current study, which aimed to understand pregnant women and new mothers' attitudes about alcohol use during pregnancy and the risks associated with prenatal alcohol exposure explore their perspectives regarding the effectiveness of existing FASD prevention campaigns, and lastly, generate recommendations for creating an effective community-based FASD prevention campaign utilizing non-stigmatizing messaging and imagery. I will now proceed with speaking about the methods for my study. A total of 12 pregnant women and new mothers, up to approximately one year postpartum, between the ages of 17 and 45 across the Sudbury and Manitoulin regions of Northeastern Ontario participated in the study. Participant recruitment was conducted utilizing various social media platforms and through the assistance of community agencies and local organizations, including but not limited to the organizations located at the bottom of the screen. For the data collection, the study has employed small group and individual semi-structured interviews, which were conducted virtually via Zoom. Open-ended questions were used to allow participants to share their opinions and perspectives regarding the research objectives. For instance, participants were asked, what are your thoughts about alcohol use during pregnancy? And what are your opinions of the information presented by current FASD prevention campaigns? 
In addition, a total of 10 images of existing FASD prevention efforts were used to guide individual and small group discussions. Lastly, the data obtained from this study was analyzed using a qualitative content analysis to generate salient categories from participants' responses. Upon the completion of the qualitative content analysis, a total of seven categories and 19 subcategories were developed. Considering the time limit for today's presentation, not all the results generated will be presented. However, I will proceed with sharing some of the more prominent findings. Findings have revealed that participants have favorable attitudes towards abstaining from alcohol use during pregnancy. For instance, one participant stated, I'm pretty adamant about restraining from alcohol use during pregnancy. I feel very strongly against it personally. However, when participants were asked what would be considered a safe amount of alcohol to consume during pregnancy, results revealed that most participants perceived low level drinking to be safe. In addition, Wine was perceived to have less severe consequences when consumed during pregnancy in contrast to other types of alcoholic beverages such as whiskey and beer. For instance, a participant noted, I know there has been a lot of studies and from what I understood, having one glass of wine during your pregnancy is not going to make a huge difference. Regarding FASD prevention efforts, Findings indicated that participants associated the overall effectiveness of FASD prevention campaigns with the strength and clarity of the campaign messaging, if the campaign has an emotional impact, and the overall relatability of the imagery used. For instance, campaigns with a strong message were perceived as being more effective at preventing alcohol use during pregnancy than those with a perceived weak message. One participant mentioned, I think this is by far my favorite because it's very impactful and has a strong message without being upsetting to pregnant women. Additionally, another participant expressed, it's not making you reflect or making you second guess. I don't feel like it's a very strong message. In addition, FASD prevention campaigns that evoked a strong emotional response were perceived as more effective than prevention campaigns that did not have an emotive impact. For instance, one participant mentioned, it is one with less emotional impact, but still has the right amount of information and visuals. It manages to grab you without that emotional punch. Another participant stated, the most effective was the too young to drink, just because it's so emotionally rattling. Results also revealed the more relatable the campaign imagery was, the more effective the campaign was perceived to be. For instance, a participant expressed, it pulled me in. I really like the photo of the girl holding her belly. That's how I looked when I was pregnant. I feel connected to that photo. Lastly, results show that messaging used on FASD prevention campaigns needs to be short and concise, and that FASD prevention initiatives are currently lacking and require enhanced accessibility and messages of support. In summary, though many pregnant women and new mothers express favorable attitudes towards abstaining from alcohol use during pregnancy, misconceptions are prevalent among this population regarding what constitutes a safe amount of alcohol to consume during pregnancy. While participants often perceived evocative messaging and imagery to be effective at preventing alcohol use during pregnancy, this conflicts with best practices for FASD prevention as such messaging and imagery can reinforce stigma about FASD and alcohol use during pregnancy. Therefore, more research is needed that explores what specific factors make these evocative messages and imagery more effective from the perspectives of pregnant and postpartum individuals to create FASD prevention campaigns that are both effective and non-stigmatizing. Lastly, to conclude my presentation, I will speak about the implications of my study. A few aspects in which I'd like to emphasize regarding the importance of my study include, FASD and alcohol use during pregnancy are reported being growing public health concerns in many Northern Canadian regions, including Northern Ontario. To date, minimal research exists that has explored FASD and alcohol use during pregnancy 
in the Sudbury and Manitoulin regions of Northeastern Ontario. And understanding attitudes are vital to reducing the prevalence of alcohol exposed pregnancies and informing effective FASD prevention efforts. Therefore, the study aims to educate pregnant individuals and new mothers on the effects of alcohol use during pregnancy, reduce the risk of alcohol exposed pregnancies, understand pregnant and postpartum individuals' attitudes about alcohol use during pregnancy, contribute to the growing FASD discourse in Northeastern Ontario, and also help inform non-stigmatizing community-based FASD prevention initiatives. To conclude my presentation, I would like to emphasize that the current study is being supported by Laurentia University and Public Health Sudbury and Districts. And lastly, this research is currently being funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research Scholarship, the Louise Pickard Public Health Research Grant, and the Laurentian University Research Fund. And thank you everyone for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions the audience members may have. Thank you very much, Taylor. Great job and appreciate you getting us uh, going this afternoon. So a reminder that if there's any questions for Taylor, please put them in the Q&A and we will circle back to them at the end. So our second presenter today is Monique Rebo benjamin Monique is a researcher with Dr. Mansfield Nellis Psycho Legal and FASD Research Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. She received her Master of Philosophy in Pharmacology from the University of the West Indies, Jamaica, and a Master of Science in Community and Population Health Sciences from the University of Saskatchewan. Monique is passionate about research that seeks to address social determinants to improve health outcomes for the most vulnerable in society. Monique's presentation today will explore the perceptions of cannabis use in adults with FASD. Um, are you able to see my screen, Kelly? Yep. Good to go. Um, just a minute here. Um, is it in full screen mode? No, it looks like it's still in your PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, there you go. But you're on, it looks, there you go. All good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, oh, thank you for that introduction, Kelly. Um, I am Monique Rebo. Um, I'm not quite sure if I should be saying good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are located in Canada. This might be a little bit different, so I'll just start by saying um, hello to um, everyone viewing this presentation. Um, this um, work that I'll be speaking about is entitled Cannabis Use Among Adults with Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, and specifically um, looking at our survey findings. Um, so I'll begin by um, just stating that I'm presenting on behalf of um, our very collaborative research team, um, including individuals with lived experiences, caregivers, frontline staff, as well as our research staff. Um, and so our research question actually came to us from the CAN FASD Family Advisory Committee, which is a group of caregivers. Um, and they were just wondering about the impact of cannabis in adults with FASD. And so um, we took up the mantle of um, exploring this very topic. Um, so um, the purpose of this um, presentation today is really just to look at the patterns of use and the benefits and side effects of cannabis from the perspectives of individuals with FASD. Um, I'll also share a little bit about um, the caregivers and frontline staff perspective, um, but mostly focusing on um, the perspective of adults with FASD. And I'll only be sharing our um, survey findings. Um, we did also look at interviews and focus group and trying to understand um, even deeper some of the questions that we had. Um, however, I won't be um, sharing those today. 
So just a little background, um, cannabis uh, was legalized in, I believe, October and November of 2018. And since that time, there has been an increase in use in the general population from 22% up to about 27% in 2020. Um, looking at the cannabis, the data form, which is simply just a database of um, a database collected from about 30 diagnostic clinics across Canada, um, inputting information about individuals with FASD. And so analyzing this database, we found that about 43% of adults reported using cannabis. Um, and so this is obviously um, much greater than in the general population. And so we proceeded to look at um, what's the link and why is there this increase in use? Um, the literature tells us that animal models suggest there is an overlap between um, pathways and cellular mechanism um, involved in neuro neurodevelopmental disorders and the endocannabinoid system. Now, the, endocan now, the endocannabinoid system um, is the system through, through which cannabis acts to exert its effects, particularly anti-inflammatory and immune regulation response. So there is a plausibility um, for cannabis use as possible treatment um, for a range of emotional and behavioral symptoms um, in adults with FASD. Um, to this end, um, one study has shown that CBD can reduce disruptive behavior in children and young adults with FASD. There are some limitations to this study. Um, for example, it, didn't, it did not state um, the dosage that was used, and it was a very small sample of five individuals. No, I refer, I refer CBD, uh, meaning the neuroprotective components of cannabis, which is called cannabidiol. And then there is the psychoactive component, THC. Um, so our survey sample um, consisted of um, individuals with FASD or those who identified with FASD from across Canada. They had to be over the age of 18 and be a Canadian resident. And so for our um, surveys, we had 116 individuals completing the surveys. For the demographics, 58% uh, were males and 53%, which is just a little over half, um, were within the age range of 18 to 30 years. And interestingly, 60% um, identified as having a diagnosis of FAS. Um, and so our team was quite concerned about this relatively high number of FAS seen in, in our sample. Um, and we perceived that there might be some misunderstanding of the actual term FAS versus FASD. When we looked at prevalence of cannabis use, we see here that 84% of the sample um, reported um, currently using cannabis versus 96%, which is the light blue um, color on your screen, 96% having a lifetime cannabis use. And this simply means that at um, some point um, across their lifespan, they have used cannabis at least once. We also asked about the mean age at which they had started using cannabis. Um, and that was reported um, at an average of 15 years old. Continuing with patterns of use, um, you will see here on your screen in the green, 36% um, report to using one to five grams of dried cannabis. There is an additional 10% of individuals who were not able to quantify um, the amount of cannabis that they were using. <clears throat> Additionally, we asked about the combinations, whether you know, they were using THC or CBD and in what combination. And here we see um, that um, over 50% of the individuals were using predominantly high THC concentrations. Um, and then another 18% who mentioned that they were not sure or it doesn't matter what combination they were using. <clears throat> 
We also <clears throat> seek to figure out what time of day or how often they were using cannabis throughout the day. And we see here predominantly participant mentioned that they were using cannabis between the hours of 4 p.m. and midnight. And 61% actually noted that they were using cannabis between 7 and 10 p.m. And they were using cannabis three times a day or more than three times a day, according to 50% of the sample. So now I'll move on to looking at the positives and negatives effects that participants spoke about, um, identifying certain symptoms listed in the survey and looking at perceived benefits or, sim or side effects that they were experiencing. Um, so for the purpose of this um, presentation, once again, I'll be looking at only a few of the symptoms that participants um, identified on the survey as having um, a great level of effectiveness. Um, and here you can see, let me just get this out of the way. Um, here you can see in terms of tension, stress, and sleep, participants recognized that they had the greatest level of effect from the cannabis for these symptoms. Um, what you're actually seeing on the screen, um, I would like for you to focus on maybe the green highlights, which um, is participants reporting that cannabis works well or works really well. And you're seeing the pers perspective of both caregivers and frontline staff compared to adults with FASD. And you will see across these three symptoms that adults with FASD um, have a higher or they've rate these symptoms at a greater level of effectiveness when compared to um, caregivers and frontline staff. And this difference was quite significant when we looked at um, comparing both of them. But I think it's also important to note that for adults with FASD across three categories, so works well, works works well, works a little, or doesn't work. Um, the fact that a higher percentage of individuals note that cannabis works really well for these symptoms, it was actually shown to be quite significant um, impact on their well-being. Then for the negative effects, we ask participants, how often does cannabis cause symptoms off? And for the biological effects, we asked about sleep, eating too much and short-term memory loss. Now, if you focus on the blue section we have on the, um, I believe this is my right or your left, um, we have caregiver's perceptions. And then on the other side of the screen, we're looking at adults with FASD. And if you focus on the blue, we see where um, adults with FASD are indicating that they typically don't have these responses, these negative responses, compared to caregivers and frontline staff who indicate that they typically see some of these responses in, in, in adults when they use cannabis. Similarly, for the psychological effect, we're seeing a disparity between the perceptions of the adults versus caregivers and frontline staff. Um, frontline staff um, typically report um, seeing some amount of psychosis, aggression, and behavioral problems. Um, and so when we had the discussion about why is there this disparity, um, we came to the consensus as a team that it's likely that participants, well, caregivers having experienced or seen this happening in their loved ones, it's actually created quite an impactful imagery in their minds. And so it might stand out more to them. And so that image will last, with, will stay with them for a longer period of time. Whereas in the adults with FASD, typically are so much more focused on the positive effects that they're able to, to see or able to gain from using cannabis. And there's a bit of a disregard for the negatives. Um, so just to kind of wrap up some of the findings um, that I've just um, mentioned, um, we're seeing where cannabis use can help to manage some FASD related symptoms. Um, there's this perception of Im improved well-being and um, improvement in symptoms when individuals use cannabis modestly. If they are aware of how to regulate their symptoms, regulate their control rather, and their use of cannabis, it can have some beneficial effects. 
And then on the negative sides, we are seeing um, what, what we'll call individual variability, where there is a difference in um, the symptom relief for each participant, for each person with FASD. And so the it, it might be necessary for some interventions such as cycle education and discussion of risk versus benefit discussions to motivate change. There is also a need for um, physician consultation before the use. Um, for the broader study, when we looked at both the survey findings and the interview findings, there is this strong team of theme of self-medication, um, which suggests that adults with FASD are not, they, they perceive rather that their symptoms, um, both emotional and behavioral, are not being um, are not being taken care of by the tradition through the traditional healthcare means. And so they're seeking alternatives. Um, but with that comes negative effects that could likely be due to inappropriate strains or ratio of cannabis. Um, and then in terms of um, the use and the time of the um, maybe it is important to look at what interventions can be put in place for those who are using cannabis between 4 p.m. and midnight. Um, as we were going through, we um, took two years to do the recruitment for this study, um, simply because we really wanted to, to get the perspective of adults with FASD who did not use cannabis. Um, and we we're re realizing now that this is um, something that is quite unlikely. Um, there's such a small percentage of individuals with FASD without cannabis use, but it would still be interesting to learn um, from them, from their perspective, why this is so um, and, and why they've never used it and what symptom relief they've experienced, in, they've experienced throughout their lifespan. Um, and so the, that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Monique. I've had the honor of listening to you give variations of this presentation and this data a few times, and I just always appreciate the opportunity to learn. And I think such a timely and interesting topic that people have a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts on. So I appreciate you sharing some of the findings today. Thank you. Our next presentation is a fun one and a, and a new one for the trainees. So um, our next presentation actually includes two of our trainees, Lisa Taylor and Lauren Nett. Lisa is one of the regional coordinators for the New Brunswick FASD Center of Excellence. She is responsible for FASD prevention, community needs assessment, and providing support and intervention to clients and families affected by FASD through service promotion and education. Lauren is a master's student in the community psychology program at Wilfrid Laurier University. Lauren's research has allowed her to work collaboratively with organizational members from the New Brunswick FASD Center of Excellence. Lisa and Lauren will be presenting on a collaborative project aimed at better understanding the experiences of adults with FASD, their caregivers, and other supportive individuals during the transition to adulthood. So Lisa, Lauren, over to the two of you. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, for that introduction. That was great. Um, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to tell you about my master's research project, which aims to understand the transition into adulthood for adults with FASD and provide a holistic overview of the factors that can enable them to reach their goals for adulthood. I'll also be explaining how Lisa and I are connected and why we're doing this presentation together. So just a brief overview of our presentation objectives. So firstly, we wanna provide an overview of the New Brunswick FASD Center of Excellence, which Lisa is affiliated with. Um, we, I also wanna provide an overview of my research thesis regarding the transition into adulthood for adults with FASD, and then discuss the implication for the research thesis findings and data. So a bit about us. So I'll get it started. So my name is Lauren Gannett. I am in my second year of my community psychology master's program. And I'm very passionate about disability studies and disability justice, which was why I was very excited to work with my supervisor, Dr. Melody Morton Nino Mia, whose research focuses heavily on working with individuals with FASD. 
And before I pass it off to Lisa, I do want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from Toronto and I'm meeting with you on the land that is traditional to territory, many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 and with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I am grateful to be living and working on this land, and I will continue to actively advocate for reparations and equity for Canada's Indigenous communities. Now passing it off to Lisa. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so my name is Lisa Taylor, as um, Lauren introduced me earlier, and I am one of the coordinators here in New Brunswick, um, as Kelly had said. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the land on which I gather um, is the tr um, traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, um, Métis, and um, Pasequama um, people. So, you want to go to the next scene, Lauren? Thank you. So an overview of the um, NBFSD Center of Excellence. We are, the map there shows um, where we're actually located. And um, I am in Fredericton, as I said earlier. Um, we have coordinators around the province because our um, program is provincial mandated. So we have um, coordinators here in, um, in the, in various regions in the province. Next screen, Lauren, please. So the mission of the center is to help to decrease the number of um, alcohol use birth throughout aware, sorry, decrease alcohol exposed birth through awareness and prevention and provide um, diagnosis and education to individuals with FASD and their families and build community capacity through collaboration, which is what um, we're doing with um, Lauren at the moment. So our vision is to bring awareness to, the, um, to New Brunswick about FASD and the, um, the risk of alcohol during pregnancy <clears throat> supporting pregnant um, people. Sorry, just a minute. Supporting pregnant people to help reduce substance use. Um, those diagnosed with FASD or may have FASD and, and their support people, as well as service providers and professionals. We um, access timely assessment for those suspected of having um, FASD and person centered services to provide, sorry, to provide person centered um, trauma informed services. So that's our vision. The moment we are working, <clears throat> we are bringing awareness to um, the people of New Brunswick through education. We're doing some um, more prevention work now, and we're hoping that we will be able to provide a um, more timely assessment. We're working on, on that. Um, of course, yes, we're providing a lot of person-centered um, services to the families, caregivers, um, support people, service providers, as well as professionals that we, um, we're servicing. So we are the only bilingual um, clinic um, here in the um, in the East Coast. We offer prevention, diagnosis, intervention, and support pre and post, um, and that is intervention and support is for pre and post diagnosis. So once we receive a referral from um, we receive a referral and our managers given the okay that you know, we can now, it's on the wait list, 
we are working with our clients immediately as if they've been diagnosed with FASD. We will work with the clients until the client said, oh, we are good, we don't need your services anymore. So and so reason for moving from just not just working with children, but we move right into adulthood. And this is, um, and Lauren will share um, that part when we get to it. That's one of the reasons we're collaborating with Lauren on this project um, research she's doing, because we service um, a lot of adult clients. Um, creating and leading communities of practice and education and training, as I said earlier. Our team. So we do have our program manager, um, Annette, and we have for the operation um, section of the team, that we have seven regional community coordinators, two Aboriginal liaison and a clinical coordinator. We work with the um, diagnostic team, which consists of our pediatrician, psychologist, um, occupational therapist, speech and language pathologist. We have two admin um, administrators, um, um, and they also work along with our diagnostic team as well as us and our program manager, as well as a training specialist we have with new. Um, so the training specialist is our quality assurance training and um, continuing professional developmental coordinate, development coordinator. Uh, we will be having an education um, specialist um, in the fall, so stay tuned, as well as we're hoping, we're, our team is growing, so I want to say that our team is growing um, because we see there's a need for um, a quick response to getting assessment done. Our goals is to support, lead, and orientate families to um, resources, collaborate with organizations to provide FASD awareness and education through various media forms. And um, we have been through the, pan through the pandemic and continuing. We have been, we've changed the way in which we provide um, education or training. We, before, if it's not in person, then we'd have difficulty um, providing the training, but now we're doing a lot more webinars as we're doing here today. We're networking um, with community-based with community agency to build community capacity and connect adults affected by FASD with appropriate support and service, um, services and education. Great. I hand over to um, Lorraine. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. That was great. Um, yeah, so now I'll talk through my master's thesis, which my degree is a research-based degree. So I've been working on developing this research project. It's really sort of in its beginning stages. So if you have any suggestions or feedback or questions about it, please let me know. And I'm always looking for feedback. So let's just take you through the main steps of my research protocol. So the first step is identifying the focus of my research, which happened through reviewing existing literature and conversations between Lisa and myself. Then I wanted to outline the goals of my research, choose the best methodology, methodological approach for answering my research questions, and then decide how this knowledge can be distributed. So before I chose my research topic, I consulted with Lisa, who's an expert on FASD with a wealth of knowledge and experience in the field. Together, we identified a need for more information on the unique needs, desires, and abilities of individuals with FASD during their transition into adulthood. Most current research only highlights the negative aspects of living with FASD, which hinders our ability to comprehend their overall life experiences. This lack of strengths-based information 
also makes creating support systems that prioritize their strengths challenging. Furthermore, after turning 18, many adults with FASD face difficulties accessing resources and services to help them achieve their goals in adulthood due to the scarcity of services for individuals with FASD who have now aged out of their childhood services. Therefore, my research aims to explore the experiences and viewpoints of adults with FASD and their support systems to better understand their transition into adulthood and identify beneficial support strategies and systems during this transitional phase. So my research will be set up and interpreted using three main theoretical frameworks. So the first one is self-determination theory, which is a crucial framework in, for the study. It highlights that everyone has inherent psychological needs for competence, autonomy, and connection, as this can lead to positive experiences like feeling empowered, which can then improve quality of life. By applying the principles of self-determination theory, I aim to analyze how adults' feelings of autonomy, competence, and connection affect their transition into adulthood. This insight can then be utilized to create effective interventions and support strategies that foster self-determination and improve overall well-being. An FASD-informed framework will be used, and it involves using knowledge about FASD to decide to guide how individuals and services support individuals with FASD. It emphasizes incorporating FASD knowledge into support practices, understanding the strengths and challenges of individuals with FASD, providing person-centered accommodations, offering strengths-based support, foster and fostering positive relationships between individuals with FASD and their support providers. For my research, these principles will shape the interview guide, the data analysis strategy, and the discussion on the findings. And lastly, critical disability theory challenges individual-focused views of disability by exploring the societal factors that impact individuals with disabilities. By incorporating critical disability theory, my aim is to challenge ableist assumptions advocate for social inclusion, and promote the rights and agencies of adults with FASD. This can be achieved by providing a platform for adults with FASD to share their lived experiences through the interviews, exposing oppressive symptoms, and highlighting their strengths and capacities. Now, taking a look at my research design, so through semi-structured interviews, I will collect qualitative data from adults with FASD and the people who support them. So that can be caregivers, social workers, romantic partners. And by doing so, I strive to gain valuable insights on their perspectives regarding transitioning from childhood to adulthood for the adults with FASD. So once I gather this information from the participants, I'll dedicate time to analyze their stories and identify the main themes. So to accomplish this, I'll use the method called thematic analysis, which involves coding and categorizing the data while searching for patterns and recurring ideas. Through this process, I aim to uncover common themes in their stories and gain a comprehensive understanding of the experience of transitioning into adulthood. And then once I have all that data, I want to figure out how to get it out there. So some ideas I have in terms of knowledge mobilization are to publish the findings in academic journals and media platforms to further share that information. I'm also planning to work with participants to decide how the information about their experiences should be distributed to key stakeholders, such as adults with FASD, support people, social workers, and health professionals. And I would also work with those key stakeholders to figure out what information is most pressing for their sectors and how that should be distributed. So more into how the data might be used. Um, the main themes and findings from the study will be shared with the participants and key stakeholders, including national and international research bodies and organizations working in the field of FASD. So like CANFAST and the center, uh, government funders, 
professionals. So that could be doctors, just system workers, um, those diagnosed with FASC and their support people. This knowledge sharing aims to inform and shape future interventions to ensure they meet individuals' needs and experiences. By leveraging these insights, our goal is to create and develop tailored solution, address support gaps, and advocate for positive changes that improve the lives of individuals with FASD through patient-centered care. Thank you so much for listening, and please let us know if you have any comments or questions. Thank you so much, Lauren and Lisa. That was great. And so nice to hear you co-present together about building this community-based project and how that collaboration has led to future work. I think that's so lovely. So um, a reminder, again, just if you have any questions for any of our speakers today, please put them in the Q&A. Or if you're a panelist and you can't actually put it in the Q&A, you can put it in the chat. Um, I haven't seen any come in and had the same thing happen last week. So I'm encouraging folks to uh, speak up or type up if you have any any questions for the end. So with Thank that, you. no worries. Thanks, Lisa. With that, I will pass it off to our final presenter for the day, who is Kathleen Holmstrom. Kathleen is a first year graduate student in the School in Clinical Psychology program at the University of Alberta. She spent her undergraduate years researching cognitive and behavioral development in childhood and is currently aiding in research related to FASD and the justice system. Kathleen's presentation will explore current research and interpersonal dialogue related to educators' experiences while working with students with FASD, including understanding FASD, translating knowledge into practice, and implementing strategies in educational settings. Awesome. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. So today I will be talking about FASD and education, specifically with regards to educational staff and knowledge, understanding and implementation in school settings. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am from Edmonton, Alberta, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional and time honored gathering place of vibrant and diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. It is important to recognize that as a white woman and as a graduate student at the U of A, I'm part of a history of colonization. Um, acknowledging this history is a step towards fostering understanding, respect, and reconciliation. And today we come together virtually, but we must remember that this land has been a place of sacred cultural traditions for countless generations. We honor the enduring presence and stewardship of the indigenous peoples who have cared for this land since time immemorial. So today I'll briefly touch on background information to provide context for this presentation, outline recent research regarding knowledge of FASD in education, go through some important points of understanding FASD in educational settings, then cover some implementation strategies for FASD in schools. So for some background, um, I chose to explore this topic despite it not being an active research project of mine. So I have had the privilege excuse me, of working at Inner City High School in Edmonton for the past six years on their inclusive education team. Inner City strives to provide Edmonton's marginalized Indigenous youth and other urban youth with tools and opportunities to break the cycle of poverty, desperation, and dependence that dominates their lives, enabling them to become contributing members of our community. During this time, I have had the opportunity to work closely with a diverse student population, including those diagnosed with FASD. Working with these remarkable students has opened my eyes to the unique challenges they face within the education system. Witnessing firsthand the barriers that these students encounter within the education system has highlighted the critical need for increased knowledge, understanding, and implementation of effective strategies and accommodations. By enhancing the awareness and expertise of educational staff, we can create a supportive and inclusive environment that fosters their success. So as I said, although this presentation does not stem from my active research endeavors, I am passionate about advocating for the betterment of education for all students, particularly those with FASD. It is my belief that by sharing insights, research, and best practices, we can collectively contribute to a more informed and compassionate educational approach. So that being said, let's explore research into knowledge of FASD in educational contexts. So a recent systematic review that spanned data from 1990 to 2021 sought to understand the knowledge, attitudes, and experiences of professionals in various settings, including educational. So with regards to awareness and knowledge, 
One study found that 74% of early ed childhood educators had heard of FASD or alcohol-related impacts for more than four years. However, two studies revealed that most school nurses and nearly half of educators were unaware of diagnostic features of FASD. Educators generally had accurate knowledge regarding challenges associated with FASD, such as its impact on learning. <clears throat> they were also relatively accurate in defining terms related to FASD and recognizing the variability among individuals with FASD. However, when asked about the prevalence of FASD, a little under half of educators correctly identified the actual prevalence. Overall, self-reported knowledge of FASD among early childhood educators was low, with most reporting they had a little knowledge of FASD. Regarding attitudes and beliefs, six studies found that the majority of educators believed that FASD is lifelong and does not change over time. However, one study found that a majority of teachers endorsed the idea that people impacted by FASD can outgrow it. Additionally, secondary teachers were more likely than elementary teachers to believe that students with FASD have control over their challenges and should be able to uh, regulate their behaviors. With regards to practices and experiences, most participants in the studies indicated a limited experience with FASD. For example, a significant percentage of educators were unaware if they had taught a child with FASD. Regarding the concern about children with FASD in classrooms, most early childhood educators and teachers, administrators, and program assistants expressed that FASD was a concern. However, educators demonstrated limited knowledge of available services and interventions for children with FASD. Regarding education and training, participants reported feeling unprepared to deal with FASD in most of these studies. The findings regarding training were mixed, with some studies reporting that educators had received training on FASD, while others indicated that a majority had not received any training. The main resources used by educators included continuing education, colleagues, journals, and support agencies. Educators expressed a need for, for uh, classroom strategies, resources for identifying FASD, and referral resources. So in summary, these studies revealed limited experience with FASD among education workers, limited knowledge of available interventions, and varying levels of preparedness and training. Educators expressed concerns about FASD in their classrooms, and identified the need for additional resources and training to effectively support children impacted by FASD. So that leads us into our next topic of understanding FASD in educational contexts. So a recent master's thesis from the University of Alberta sought to understand educational perspectives from adolescents who have been diagnosed with FASD. So the first theme, I'm aware of some ways to manage emotions and some of what adds to my struggles acknowledges the self-awareness that adolescents with FASD may have regarding their challenges and have developed coping strategies to manage their emotions and struggles. In addition, they are aware of their areas of strength and what they excel at. Lastly, they are aware of the difficulties they face in completing academic tasks, engaging in life skill activities, adhering to behavioral expectations, and adapting to certain environments. Despite this, these youths possess their own coping strategies, which teachers can support. The second theme, I have preferences for the ways I learn, denotes that adolescents with FASD may enjoy learning more when it is engaging and fun, to the point where it doesn't feel like traditional learning. They may have a preferred way of learning involving demonstrating or explaining what they can, what they know or can do. And they take pride in themselves, draw strengths from their cultural identities, and possess confidence in their abilities despite their struggles. The third theme, I value and desire meaningful relationships, highlights that adolescents with FASD value and desire meaningful relationships, but they face challenges in interpersonal communication. They may struggle with expressing their concerns about interpersonal issues and may be unsure about the best course of action in these situations. Additionally, adolescents with FASD can have unique ways of relating to others and expressing themselves, which may serve as both strengths and challenges as they foster individuality, but also may make it more difficult to connect with others who don't understand their uniqueness. Despite these difficulties, relationships remain significant to them. So this is, this was a study done to identify caregiver support needs of um, children with FASD. And they came up with five different concepts. So the first concept highlights the importance of educators recognizing and valuing the insights and perspective of caregivers and understanding the unique needs of children impacted by FASD. It emphasizes the need for open and effective communication between educators and caregivers, with ed educators actively listening to the suggestions and input provided by caregivers. Qualities such as teamwork, supportive administration, and a willingness to listen to caregivers' knowledge of their children's needs are critical. 
The second concept emphasizes the need for educators who possess both awareness of the unique needs of students with FASD and a willingness to address those needs effectively. This includes FASD specific training for educators to understand the impact of FASD on students' educational experiences, practical changes that could occur with improved FASD literacy, such as knowing when to intervene, developing coping strategies, implementing accommodations, and being able to diffuse challenging situations. The third concept stresses that caregivers play a crucial role in advocating for their child's education and ensuring that it is tailored to their unique needs. Effective communication with educators is important, as well as familiarization with available educational resources in schools and the community. The fourth concept highlights the importance of acquiring knowledge about FASD and using it to support students impacted by FASD in their educational experience. Such areas include professional knowledge, education about intergenerational and colonial effects, and training. Support groups are also seen as valuable sources of information, as having someone on their side who understands FASD could facilitate advocacy efforts. The fifth and final concept emphasizes the importance of caregivers to adapt their skills and understand their child's limitations. They should be flexible, realistic, and patient. Practical steps like focusing on social skills, creating a supportive home environment, and advocating for their child are important. Caregivers should work towards setting appropriate goals, being realistic when possible, and having hope without setting their child up for future obstacles. So now that we have covered knowledge of FASD and understanding FASD in educational context, I'll touch on a few implementation strategies to create an inclusive learning environment for students with FASD. So some, <clears throat> excuse me, some general implementation strategies for students with FASD include relationships. So foster trust, openness, and non-judgment by establishing positive relationship with students. Create a supportive and inclusive classroom environment where students feel comfortable expressing themselves and seeking help when needed while providing appropriate supervision. Consistency, which is, you know, provide routines and structured learning environments to help students with FASD navigate their daily activities assist them with transitions between tasks or activities by providing clear instructions and visual cues, immediately address any problem behaviors and have a consistent safe space for any outbursts. Positive reinforcement, so use praise, encouragement, and compliments to acknowledge and reinforce students' efforts and achievements. This positive reinforcement helps motivate students and boosts their self-esteem. Simplicity, uh, break down complex tasks into smaller, more manageable steps, provide clear and concise instructions with key information, reducing cognitive load for students with FASD, use visual aids such as diagrams or charts, charts that are clear and straightforward to enhance understanding. Organizational supports are also helpful. Specificity, offer focused tasks that target specific learning objectives, tasks with smaller steps alongside visual supports or reminders to help students stay on track and work through assignments. Repetition. Allow for ample practice and repetition of skills and concepts. Students with FASD may require additional time to process information, so build in opportunities for think time and reinforce learning through repeated exposure and practice. Differentiate learning, sorry, differentiate teaching. Uh, implement multi-sensory learning strategies that engage different senses to enhance comprehension and retention. Vary instructional methods to accommodate different, uh, diverse learning styles and preferences among students with FASD. In addition, incorporate frequent short movement breaks throughout the day. It's also important to keep in mind that each student is their own person, and as such, both developmental and cultural considerations should be taken into account when implementing these strategies and more. Thank you. Here are my references. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I think also a very important and uh, timely topic as well with lots of good recommendations and implications for folks. So um, appreciate the diversity of all of the talks today. And at this point, I will ask all of our presenters to come back, um, turn your videos on, and we'll, we'll open it up to Q&A. So a question that I would like to ask all of our speakers today that came in is, what, if anything, has surprised you in your research or in your work? I guess I could go first. <laughs> so for me personally, what has really surprised me is the complex nature surrounding alcohol use during pregnancy and FASD, um, as well as the stigmatization of current FASD prevention initiatives are still being perceived as effective at preventing alcohol use during pregnancy. 
despite um, the probable repercussions of evoking negative emotions for viewers. So I, I can um, add on to that, Taylor. So mine, it's not surprising. Um, it's acknowledging that stigma is real and throughout the country, because we're from different parts of the province, I'm hearing the same thing highlight the same thing has been highlighted from time to time, even in your work that you have all um, you're doing, that stigma is a barrier to getting support and services, be it for um, individual uh, parents, um, individuals diagnosed, um, pregnant, um, pregnant women, etc. So and if we the work around this now is for us to start working to help to reduce stigma within the field of FASD. Yeah, I would say sort of the biggest thing that surprised me since entering the field of FASD research is how it is the most prevalent developmental disorder in Canada, but I often feel like it's sort of more seen as like it is much more stigmatized than some of the other developmental disorders and there's also sort of that complex sort of like what Taylor was talking about where it's complex because there's often a lot of blame and shame put on birth mothers and that can also then lead to a lack of services for individuals with FASD and it sort of gets framed as like this individual problem and I think that something that that's inspired within me is to really advocate openly for FASC research and funding and support services. Um, I think something that has surprised me at least well, I guess with research and work was just the the point of educators not necessarily being fully aware of FASD and not knowing about it, not having background knowledge or experience or like practical knowledge, um, which is, I suppose, in part why I made this presentation because I do plan on presenting it at my workplace to help give some of our other teachers some extra knowledge on it. Some teachers are very knowledgeable. Others, I think, would really benefit from having a bit deeper understanding of FASD. Awesome. Thank you all. I think that's a kind of a lovely note to end on. And I just want to thank all of you today, all of our presenters and all of our trainees in general for your amazing and wonderful work. It's such a privilege for me to work with all of you um, and lead this program and always just think this facilitates really good discussion and hope, uh, hope it fosters a lot of new ideas for all of you and sounds like lots of future directions for your own careers. So that is the hope that all of you will go on to build your own careers doing this important work in FASD. So thank you again to all of you. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees for being here today um, and hope that you will join us in our future webinars to get more information on Can FASD and to stay in the know with respect to all of our resources, information, upcoming webinars, et cetera, please check out our website at www.canfasd.ca or follow us on our social media channels to find out more. Lastly, and most excitingly, um, many of you are probably aware that CanFASD is hosting the first ever Canada FASD conference, which is happening in November in Saskatoon. So please visit our webpage to learn more. Wishing you all a happy Friday and a happy weekend. Take care, everyone. <laughs>